uh live now yes Buzz, we're oh now we're live <laughs> okay cool because my my whole like stream started airing an ad so i guess whatever hello and uh welcome to the what is this the old, hey what? hey time out oh. no audio there's no audio Keno says no audio Okay, let me... Let me sure. Me. Oh, he means he no. doesn't have his audio on. <laughs> no. Keno, Keno, you're a douche. Keno, Keno fuck you. <laughs> okay, Keno. Wow, totally screwing up my whole, like, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> head of steam. Hello, and welcome to this week's Second Sons, which is actually happening. So, unlike last time, so we apologize for not having this. But, this, but because we were able, or we canceled last week's episode because we could not agree on a time to begin the episode because you know buzz it's like what four in the morning for buzz uh yes right now five no five in the morning now so five. we couldn't agree on the time but we're here but we get to be joined <laughs> because we delayed our episode by a very special guest who's returning to us how are you today seth how are you this evening <laughs> i'm good but every time i look at chris's face it makes me a little bit upset oh <laughs> <laughs> oh are, are I'm going to need to beam up the uh, the eighties Wolverine looking at the picture, <laughs> <laughs> cutting it in half with his claw. Oh. Wait, our other announcement is Schoenthal is now a regular. He's a host. Welcome, right. host Schoenthal. For real, thanks for having me, guys. Yes, we, so we are now uh, two New Yorkers, one Swede, two West Coasters uh, podcast. So we are probably the most diverse. Podcast Thrones pod slash video that, cast. that is so, full yeah. of all white guys, yeah. Fine. Full of all white guys. <laughs> Mostly white. Um yeah, I guess. Geographically diverse. <laughs> geographically diverse. Which in right. Thrones is what matters, right? That's what we learned this week. Um <laughs> uh, don't, so don't you get so, Johnny's hopes up if you're not gonna do it, you fuck. All right. right. So <laughs> we've been, we've introduced Seth and Chris and Glazer needs no introduction. So how are you doing, Sid? I'm doing good. Uh back to work. Life's busy, but also uh, finding time for stuff like this makes it all worthwhile. And Buzz, how are you? I, I hear you did pretty well last, uh, or I guess two weekends ago now, right? Last weekend. Uh, no, wait, all yeah. was last week, right? You I had, had fun. Good, you had... All right, well, let's start then with you having fun. How did Valberg <laughs> go? Wait, no, that's not where we were starting. You're uh, ruining – Seth's going to ruin his credibility before you can talk about important well, things. Well, that's right. That's remember? right. I'm yes. sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize, Seth. Seth is on here it's very specific to talk about his uh, senpai's proposal <laughs> that uh, <laughs> is currently on CardGameDB, which I will link. Uh, it will be in both the audio versions, uh, the SoundCloud text, and in the YouTube to make sure you can read this. But Corey, uh, multiple world champion, uh, not the people's champion, as we call Buzz here. Uh, uh, but multiple world champion uh, Corey has a proposal uh, for the Thrones community about sort of the future of the competitive scene that sort of Seth's on here to talk about. So Seth, why don't you lay out what Corey's proposal is? Sure. So this is something Corey, Corey and I and all of us have been talking about for a couple months. Some of the issues we have with organized play and just the competitive scene in the community at the moment. And trying to think of what can be a solution? How can this be better next year and the year after? How can we have a better game, a uh, better competitive scene. So what Corey wrote about and posted on Card Game DB is the idea to have a Player of the Year award. And the way it works is it's based entirely on pre-existing tournaments. Any tournament that is held is, is qualified. And based on the size of the tournament, there's a certain number of points allotted. And based on placement in the tournament, any participant gets a certain number of those points. Uh, and then at the end of a year, of a full year season, ending with Stalic in the World Championship, a player is crowned player of the year. And there's lots of details involved about how the scoring might work, or one notion that Corey likes is to split it between North America and the rest of the world, so you would have two winners, uh, or even to do it categories for more casual players and more competitive players. But really all the details can be set to the side. And the core component is just aggregating data from every tournament that's held that wants to participate and then pooling together uh, a sort of system to determine who is the player of the year. 
And so the whole point of this is to make all these many smaller tournaments, to bind them together, to give them some purpose, uh, and to have a reason for people to play in more tournaments, for people to care more about different tournaments. So that's sort of his proposal. And I think the advantage of an approach like this over a lot of what has been discussed, like, for example, having a separate tournament scene based around a new series of tournaments that's held, the problem with that is somebody has to organize and hold all these new championship tournaments. This is just based off all the pre-existing tournaments. So Kublai Khan, uh, the Battle of Summer Hall in Atlanta, whatever, any tournament anywhere exactly. is qualified. They're all joined together and that they contribute to this sort of ranking system. Um, and really the goal ultimately is to make more tournaments matter, make people care more about traveling and playing in tournaments, and give a reason, something for people to follow throughout the year instead of just a few tournaments. So that's kind of the goal. Corey put a big post up on Card Game DB about it. And what I would like everybody to do, if you think it's a good idea, or if you're interested in uh, participating in terms of defining the details of what it should look like, what it will look like, then please go and make a post on that thread. And so, just just to either offer a suggestion or say, yes, I like this idea. I'm going to throw the first question from chat, actually, which is from Glazer Sucks Balls, which I think is John Bruno. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, wouldn't someone, this is a direct quote from Glazer Sucks Balls again, who I think is Bruno, uh, wouldn't someone who had the opportunity to play in more events have an advantage over someone who doesn't get the chance to play in many events. So it's more about your ability to attend events versus necessarily your play skill. I yeah, it's so. pretty, I think it's pretty easy to mitigate that in a couple of ways. One, uh, you weigh tournaments by number of players. So you can go to a lot of smaller tournaments, but maybe those are only worth a 20th of the points of what you get at a Gen Con or local tournaments are worth less than regionals and that can all be defined later i think also that's part of the point is you want to encourage people to play more travel more you want to if if a meta is able to have a weekly tournament of 30 people you want them to be advantaged you want them to have the advantage because of that you want to encourage that sort of participation if it's really a concern we can build in a defeat for that we can say you only count the points from your top five largest tournaments or something like that. I mean, it's pretty easy when you get to the details to deal with that situation. Uh, I think the point is just to make these other tournaments matter more, make regionals, make fun events, make road to Stalic events, give them all a similar sort of meaning and bring it all to the table in one venue. I think uh, another way you could really mitigate that, someone who couldn't travel, is uh, fold in the bigger octagon tournaments that go on. I mean, those are drawing Absolutely. in 70, 80, 100 people. So if you can't travel, play in those big tournaments of, you know, it's a 200-person tournament. That's going to be worth a lot of points if you manage to win that. So if you're if you're the hermit that thinks you're, you know, Bobby Fisher and can't go play in any tournaments, <laughs> get online and prove it. Uh, you know, don't – and I, I think it's a little bit of a thin argument to say, well, what if I'm awesome and I just can't play in any of these tournaments? It's like, well, find a way. <laughs> I Find think there's away. also an argument, oh, I mean, okay, do, so well, if wait, you don't travel, oh, so, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. You can do multiple different placements, like, you don't. You can do Player of the Year as the main title, and you can do, like, Player of, then you can do, like, several smaller titles, like Player of the Year for by region, Player of the Year by a different, you know? Like, you yeah. can have regional MVPs and different things along those lines, so it wouldn't have to just be, um, like, one person. Like, one person would get whatever the biggest prize, they, they travel, they dedicated the time, effort, and finances to do so, that's fine. But for everyone else, like, you could be the player of the year in the Northeast or the player of the year in the Midwest. And, like, that's got its own prestige to it, right? I think yeah. the key is, first of all, we want to reward the player who travels to every tournament of 40. If someone goes to all the tournaments that have 40 or more people in North America, we want more of those guys. That's somebody so you're, who's... So, so you're saying Schoenthal? I mean, we want <laughs> anybody who builds the community in that way, I want them to be player of the year. I'm not concerned about mm -hmm. that. But I think also it's not necessarily about being number one. If you can't travel as much, maybe you're number 12. But if we've got 600 names on this sheet because everybody who participated in a tournament in America is on there and you're 12th, that's pretty good. I mean, you can carry that with you anywhere. So the more attention it gets, the more buy-in it gets. And it's just built off the tournaments that are already taking place. 
uh, the more value coming in the top 20, the top 10, whatever means for that year. Mm. What do you think of the claim that because you can't win a tournament, this is a way for you to win with a bunch of second places? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. I mean, fundamentally, right? I mean, let's be completely honest here. Like, what this is, is... I think it's very refreshing, though, which is an understanding that the, the main problem compared to the Thrones has, right, is we only really look at people that win tournaments rather than necessarily people who have shown a consistent performance, like someone like Seth, but there are other players in the community who haven't necessarily gotten that title yet, right? Who, who you know, they, they consistently have been in the top four top eight of big tournaments this could mean road to Starlock events this can mean you know tournaments in in the united states like there are tons of players like this that you consistently see in the cut at these sort of things and they don't get the kind of they get the credit for the kind of people that are in this podcast but they aren't necessarily the people who in the you know the average person who follows thrones relatively closely would necessarily know like but everyone knows who bruno is and Corey is and now Chris Schoenthal and Avaro is and all these and, and uh, you know, all these other people. But they don't necessarily know some of the people who are probably the same skill level as those players, but haven't necessarily gotten that laurel, that final Well, laurel. honestly, I don't even care if it, the point of this is not to find a better way to <clears throat> identify the best players in the world. The point is for players in Las Vegas to have a reason to travel to California for the weekend to playing a tournament. So I don't care if it's a way to identify like, oh, this person is more consistent. It's more about, man, this weekend, I'm at 19th place. And if I win this 42-person California regional, I will be in seventh place in the country. And everybody follows this page. Everybody follows this. I would like to get, I want to move up the charts. That's really the point of doing it is to make more tournaments matter and make people care more about the competitive aspect of the game. Buzz, you've been quiet. Do you have any thoughts? I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> and that, well, I, I mean, that's Buzz. the key is I'd love to do to split it, to have North America and then rest of world. Because you see, like, all of the tournaments in the Philippines and all the Road to Stalic events. Like, could you imagine the same platform to measure your Europe on its own or the rest <clears> of the world, <throat> however you want to do it, and just have a similar system there? I think it would be great. There should probably be three regions, to be completely honest. North America, yeah. Europe, and then the rest of the world. Wow. So at this point... Wow. Really... <laughs> Ow, I mean... Other? I don't... Well, but that just... Like, I'm just I, saying, Roy. That was not... I, I, but I, I, I think... You are, no, I think social, the, you are not a social justice video. I guess I'm not. But my point <laughs> is this. It's, it's more to just not let the events like that the hard work that the Filipino community has put in to be overshadowed by the Road of Stalic because they are lumped in with this sure. long-running tournament Huge circuit for those. in Europe, right? I mean, they could be lumped in with the North America. We have a much weaker tournament circuit in North America, which wouldn't be in that we don't have either. one. It could be Europe and the rest of the world. That doesn't bother me at all, in the least. But I think Europe deserves, if we're really going to think about this, I think an overall world person, but if we're also going to break it down, I do think Europe deserves its own separate best European overall player. I feel so like I we're, say, we're kind sorry, of losing sorry. here on what... Uh, the, the focus here, we're really splitting hairs at this point, trying to figure out regions and stuff like that. Um, I, I would say a couple things. I'm not super in love with the octagon idea, uh, simply from the fact that uh, much like online poker, I kind of feel like it's a different game. There's nothing saying that I'm the one behind my computer screen at octagon. Uh, no offense to octagon players, but it, it could be anybody. Um, and secondly, what, Seth, do you think are the advantages of something like this over, say, a more dynamic system like an ELO rating system or something like that where there, there's head-to-head -head and, and gains and losses instead of just a straight point system. So, excuse me, I don't want to do an ELO system. We don't want to do a rankings in that sense because we want pure value out of going to more tournaments. So you're never going to lose where you are by going to a Wednesday night event that has 16 people. You can only move forward. We just want to constantly encourage people to play in more events and encourage that participation. So the two things I wanted to say where I see somebody has a question in here, why don't we do like Magic does, regional tours, set up tournaments, because that's not realistic. I don't think it's realistic to say, hey, we're going to do eight regions in the U.S., 
best of those regions. Then we do a big tournament for the U.S. champion. We'll do it separate from FHT's system. The beauty of a system like what Corey proposed is that it's completely leveraging what we already have established. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. I don't, and, I don't think that kind of tournament circuit's out of the realm of possibility, though. I disagree with you there. I think it's getting there. Like, we had all that momentum, like, right after FFG fucked up super hard for the millionth time, and nothing happened again. Sure, and I mean, there's, there's certainly individual efforts that are, that are maybe going wasted there, but I don't, I don't think it's off the table. We'll see. I think the other problem with that is that gets a guy like you, Chris, or me to go and travel to tournaments, which is great. I will travel to the next region to try and win that event, but it doesn't give a sort of grassroots movement up. I want the guy who can go to the game night tournament on a weeknight and have there be 18 people feel like he's a part of something and see him go, wow, I've cracked the top 50, I cracked the top 100. I just want to constantly encourage people to play more tournaments all the time because that's the bedrock of us having a real community, which now we basically lack. <laughs> Fair. Well, okay. So I won't take up any more time. My request is just, if you think this is a good idea, a realistic idea, please go make a post, make a suggestion, or offer some support up on the, the thread that Corey started on Card Game DB. If we can get that to 60 posts or whatever, I feel like that's a great start. From there, we'll move on to figuring out how do we define the details. Do we elect a council to define that? Do we put up polls? I mean, we're open to ideas. We just want to get the momentum first, and then we'll get the definitions and the details later and try and launch this thing, if possible, into the next year, right after Stalic. So would you guys be running that website? Uh, oh, uh, we're open to put in more time if that's what's necessary. If we can link it to something like uh, the annals of the jousting pavilion, I haven't reached out to those people, but uh, yeah. we're willing to tie it. It's the kind of thing Alex would like. Kind of like yeah. this thing? I think Alex should be that. I think, Alex, uh, or Alex is the first comment on the post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, it could be integrated in Jousting Pavilion if it's not that. Uh, yeah, Jousting is... Pavilion is already built for that. Yeah, exactly. And we have a new uh, uh, European community uh, website coming up that could handle that, I think. Uh, like the, the rankings and stuff. Just uh, port them over from Jousting Pavilion or something like that. I think the only thing there's a lot of ways. I think Pavilion would be, uh, like Corey said in the post, like player numbers or something. So even if your name gets slightly misspelled, not that anybody here has difficult to spell names, but uh, no, Schoenthal is very easy. <laughs> no one uh, has low. those E's, Same those floating person. E's. Uh, <laughs> we all can't be named after fast food chains, right? <laughs> Although I get a D in my name all the time. So. <laughs> you get a D in lots of things. And I see, I guess I'll close or close my points on this. There's, there's comments about what would the prize be. So to me, the prize is really secondary. That's just kind of bait to get people to really build a grassroots competitive movement. Um, ideally, the prize would be you have the winner of the rest of the world or Europe flying to worlds and the winner of the United States or North America flying to Stalic. You have to get to a point where you can generate that kind of money from all the various tournaments. We can start out small, but really the prize is just... The, the satisfaction that comes from being top five, number one, the player of the year, based on 600 tournaments that are held around the world. I mean, that means a lot on its own. Yeah, I, I mean, think, though, I was going to say, I, I, I think it would be doable to, if you got the biggest tournaments in North America to all kind of buy in and all take a little bit of a, of a stipend of, of, you know, the tournament fee and to go towards towards that plane ticket i think it could work but you would need a lot of coordination because i mean that's that's a hefty price tag right to get all the way to stalic so i think the money's there and the tournament numbers are there we just have to get everyone behind it I think yeah i think you becomes... start as small as possible in terms of prize and commitment and then you just if you can get everybody if you can get tournaments buying in where they're submitting results then the sky's the limit from there you just want to make that as easy as possible and with as few strings attached for the tournament as possible Absolutely. I also think like once this becomes a proven concept, if it works, people will be more willing to donate money to pay for the North American champion to go to Stalic and the Stalic champion to come to North America, right? I think 
a cup like a year of showing oh my god people really are buying to this there is something about being player of the year in my region uh but the gl- once the glory is established people will be like oh yeah sure i'll give 20 bucks to a kickstarter to raise a thousand dollars to send somebody you know to europe or something like i think that that kind of thing will follow if it can come but established so yeah i think it's right starting small showing that we can actually execute this because many many podcasts in my year and a half that i've been involved uh and many people have suggested things like this um and it hasn't come to fruition like if it can be shown to come to fruition i think people will follow because it is like but if the glory it, alone they will come yes right to follow that um any other thoughts? Let's let me take a quick look at chat. So just, I mean, a, a vision sort of way it could look like if it comes to fruition is imagine there's a weekend where there's a tournament in Europe and there's 80 or 100 people and numbers three, four, and five on this list of player of the year for that European section are going to this tournament. And everybody knows that. Well, you can watch how those players are doing. And whoever wins this tournament, if one of those guys wins or gets second or something like that, they will be the new number one in Europe. So there's sort of everybody can see it. It's transparent ahead of time. You can follow it live as it goes on. And you can see, okay, wow. So now Buzz, he's the number one. He's the player of the year leader or whoever wins or whatever the case is. So you build Buzz around individual events or even if it's as simple as a close tie between me and Chris in the U.S. And then there's a Thursday night event with 27 people. And if Chris wins, that can put him in front. You just give something for people to rally around and something for people to follow. Right. And it makes it more transparent, right? Like one of the things I learned as I became more and more involved in the Thrones community is there are all these personalities that people follow at the Royal Dostalic events. They follow at Gen Con at Worlds and they're like, oh, Steve Simone has done well and may make the cut, right? Or Corey has a chance of doing it again. You learn this the more you, the, the more you integrate yourself. But this makes it much, much more transparent that someone who – buys the game, they initially go to the Thrones Facebook group, and this is a pinned post, like, hey, go here and see the top 500 people in the world, right? And you can immediately go, oh, okay, the top 500 people in the world are, like, Tomas, Chris Schoenthal, Seth Lowe, blah, 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 all these people, right? And you can immediately go, oh, these are interesting people that I want to see that they're on a Twitch stream, or I see that there's this post that they're going to this event. Yeah, I mean, it creates narratives that already exist and people who are listening obviously to this podcast can know know these narratives but to make them more transparent and accessible is something that i think second edition really does need i think it also gives um kind of newer players an opportunity to to prove themselves right there there, because there is a lot of i don't want to say bias towards kind of the established players but like you said we follow them we look we look to them um, it's kind of like, oh, where's where's the top players in this tournament? Shouldn't they be in the cut? You know, and there's always a little bit of <laughs> a little surprise when it, when they're not there. And this gives other players a chance to kind of to kind of make their mark fast. I mean, someone like Simone, it took a long time before the community just kind of expected him to be where he was. Mm-hmm. Seth, Seth as well. Oh yeah, it did yeah. It Simone, did. he showed up yeah. to his first Gen Con and came in like second, and then he like <laughs> won his first, and then he was second in his first Worlds. I mean, it no, was pretty. It was gone. a it he was a playing Worlds the year before. Did he? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it takes time to, to to work your way up, especially now. And I think this would be a, an interesting opportunity to see what what people um, can do, right? How high they can well, climb. The reason, one How of the many times you could play Lenny Jumper. Corey right. made a suggestion, <laughs> which is okay. When you when you're you have your first entry, you can elect to put yourself in a in a less competitive tier. So you could call it amateur, or whatever you want, and you could define that as purely voluntary or I only want to count tournaments of 55 people or less. However you define it, you have a category where if I'm not a guy who wants to go and try and be a world champion and an American champion and a Stalic champion, I can compete in my own pool and still be ranked within that pool. Uh, So there's lots of ways when we get to the nitty gritty and we start making those decisions, there's lots of ways to encourage everybody and make it as effective as possible. You, you could break it down a million ways, right? You can do it by season. You can do it by uh, your record against other top-ranked players. Like, once you have the data, you have the data. You can play with it. All right. So that's my piece. That's my pitch. Please go make a post on that Card Game BB thread if you think this is interesting, if you support it, and then we'll get some momentum, and we'll see what we can do from there. All right. Any final thoughts from non-DC folks about this? I'm excited. Sounds great. Me too. 
it's a great proposal, and I'm I'm really glad Corey uh, is is using yeah. his clout in the community to, to do this. Yeah, starting with starting with somebody who has kind of that voice, quiet but quiet but authoritative voice in the community is uh, quiet but authoritative. Yeah, I like. Yeah, uh, Corey's definitely not a guy who's going to get excited and make a post like this and then abandon it. He he, we've talked about this for several months, and. I'm surprised that he actually went ahead and decided he wanted to throw his weight behind it. So if he's willing to put in his time, I mean, he's thought about it a lot and he's, he, he's willing to make a commitment. Absolutely. All right. So now that Seth has raised his cred, we need to <laughs> spend it, right? Because that's what you do with credit, <laughs> right? Um, so let's turn towards the last big tournament, which was the Swedes, their stop in uh, the Nordic stop in the road to Stalic. So, Buzz, you were the only one of us that was there. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about the experience and sort of the results and what you think sort of firsthand, and then the rest of us can sort of chime in as outsiders. Yeah, we had the... Um, uh, on the Friday night, we had some board games, and uh, we had a first edition cube draft, which was very successful. Um, I'm not sure... I think it's posted on the Card Game DB. Very, very fun. And uh, which I want, <laughs> and uh, and then on the Saturday we had the Jousts uh, Swiss, uh, very successful I think. Uh, I'm very happy that we had a lot of viewers, um, and and that we got even though it wasn't that many players, we were like forty something. Eight maybe I don't remember. Um, we had uh, players from a lot of places in Europe and and in Sweden, and really competitive field. Good to see the Finns came in force. And uh, then we had Melee on the uh, on Sunday, which I came second in, and Riverama I think is here in the chat one. Um. And then we had the cut, uh, the, well, the, um, the finals, which I'm so happy went two and one, and it was so great games, so great games. I I really happy to see them that close. And the top two decks were Jakob was playing Lanny, Lanny Winter and Winter, Night's Watch yes. Fealty or Night's Watch Winter. I can't remember. Fealty, Fealty, yes. Fealty. Fealty. Yeah. Okay. yeah, pure defense. Pure defense. Yeah. Okay. And that without was without the bad card, the big one, seven coster. I don't really remember <laughs> its name. The old bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The old bear. Uh, old bear, something like that. All right, baby Sid just showed up. It's the, that's a required <laughs> appearance in every episode. Um, you know, you know, it's bedtime at the Sedlaski house when they start saying good night. Uh, uh, <laughs> I definitely don't have to worry about this guy, or else I'm taking him <laughs> down. Well, I'm sure there's a closet though that you might you could hide in just in case, like last time, Seth. <laughs> oh, oh shit! <laughs> that's a studio apartment of champions. <laughs> Near champions, actually, to be technical. Near, yes, that's um, true. But if we had a player of the year, I would. Uh, <laughs> If only there was a way to recognize. Although Ryan would have won what overall at Worlds last year, but now we're just rehashing. Uh, and, old, and, and, old and, Ryan, old and, and Buzz would have won melee, but here we are. <laughs> but here we uh, are. Okay. Um, so, what do we think of the meta in the after sort of this tournament? This is the first major tournament, really, with the first third, I guess, or first. Order of the uh, of the second cycle legal, uh, the season's agendas were there in force. Obviously, Jakob took it to the final. Um, so, what do we think of the meta? What do we think of sort of the tournament's results? Uh, Seth, you said you had some some capital you wanted to spend about some of these tournaments. Uh, do you want to go first? Uh, so the first thing I have to say is all positive. I mean, you watch the streams; just two good players who kind of know what's going on. I think I was more impressed by Tomas's deck. Um, I think there was a lot of cool choices in the deck. I think he understood the meta, and I think it was it was it was cool to see him win. So I only have positive things to start, but sort of 
my reflection on the way the community interpreted the event is where I might make some enemies. There we go. That's what we're here for, to make enemies. So <laughs> So you want me to get into it? All right. Oh, yeah, get into it. Yeah, like, you can't just yeah. read like that. Let's yeah, no, that's like... fine. That's fine. I thought maybe we'd have a nice, like, happy circle and everybody No, because we all agree, like, the, the, the commentary was fucking good. The stream was really well produced, which I'm going to give Buzz credit for, whether or not he did not Right, stop being positive. <laughs> we got so, shit to that, talk. There was, so there was all this feedback, like, oh, Tomas, he's so fucking good. He won, <laughs> and he didn't play big characters. Wow. And I just want to say, was nobody watching? Like, in my opinion, Kevin Shee getting top eight at Gen Con is more impressive than what Tomas did. And that's not Tomas's fault. He played in a 40-some person tournament and he won. He did the best he possibly could. But Kevin played in a 221 person tournament and made top eight. Zero people have tried to reconstruct his deck. Nobody asks about it. Nobody cares. <laughs> this guy had a cool deck with a great idea. And I mean, I just think... Alex literally messaged me two days ago and asked what agenda he was playing for the annals, a top eight player, and people didn't know what agenda he was playing. Right, like, if you're a person who's willing to step up and praise Thomas and be like, wow, great deck, that was really well done, you're probably a person who, at Gen Con, should have recorded the plots in Kevin Shee's deck and said, I want to reconstruct this. I want to learn something. Sure. Like, there's so much publicity seems to count more than facts sometimes. But, well, <laughs> by, by far... Aaron, no, hold on, Aaron. We just learned a couple of important facts here. One, that DC has deconstructed Kevin's deck and knows it straight sure. and out. <laughs> and number two is that they are not playing it at Worlds because Seth would not be talking it up this much <laughs> if they were, if were going to take it in November. So, we, But anyway, go ahead, Aaron. Um, that's a problem in Thrones that just comes from, I think, American society more than anything else in the way we look at sports. We don't care if a team makes the playoffs 15 years in a row. You either are the champion or you don't count. And the idea that you're the champion or you don't count has carried over to Thrones. And it's, you know, you might have be familiar with that idea, right? Like, we like to bust your balls about it. Like, but it's it's a silly idea. Like, deep, like the competitive players all recognize that that's a silly idea. But, like, you're average player like the conversation you see among the like you know people who don't have 15 podcasts and such is usually just like what one let's talk about what one like um I, like the dc winter deck i it took me like years to ha recreate that stupid deck because all everyone fucking cared about was house of pain but also i mean there was a lot of coverage for varberg of course uh, people were impressed with the stream People could follow Tamas in Jousting Pavilion and on the stream a lot. And <clears throat> I've no idea who Kevin is. I've not s heard about his deck. So I think it's understandable, sad, but understandable. Uh, so it's, right. not, it's, not, it's not a complaint about the fact that Tomas got more attention. I agree, but that's because it was built for him to get more attention. It's when people say, wow, this guy really did something refreshing and new. He played a different kind of game. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's just because you're not paying attention and you might be bad. <laughs> Chats brought, brought up a fairly reasonable point, though, that he played against you in top eight. So maybe if your game had been filmed, uh, maybe he would have gotten more recognition. <laughs> oh, good point. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Is this... Oh, from, from, from Kevin? If it began, Well, nobody offered to film our game, which I would have refused if they had <laughs> Um But, well, I'll tell you a story. So this is a story. Corey will be mad at me. Well, he's not watching, though. Nobody tell nobody tell the rest of DC <laughs> Meta I told this story. But when Aaron Broderick and I decided last minute to go to Origins, we I mean, we hadn't really been testing, but we were both free that weekend, so we drove up together. It was 80-some people at the tournament. We built our decks on the way. I mean, it was not really our style of how to play in a tournament. And we both agreed we weren't going to play Martell Main House because we thought we might play it for Gen Con. So we get there. We play in the tournament. We both not – we don't do very well. Aaron does better than I do. And then in the top eight – so the top eight starts, and eight people are playing. Nobody's watching. Aaron and I literally walked around and recorded notes on all of the top eight decks oh we, we knew, knew you did that everybody's deck 
everybody's plots. And you look around and nobody else is there. And I'm like, this is why I keep winning. <laughs> because other people, they, where is your commitment to learn what's good? Like, where is your respect for the time that these people put in to be good and to make the top eight? You can't just have someone serve it up to you on a silver platter like with Tomas. You know, sometimes you have to go and work for it. Wait, are you suggesting Tomas had it served up to him in silver platter or didn't? Everybody had his his information served up to them. Everybody knew he was good because you had the stream, the commentary, everything. But if yeah, you just rely on that, that, you'll be six steps behind. If you know about that deck but you don't know about Kevin Shee's deck, then you're behind me and you're behind Chris and you're behind the big metas and you need to step it up. Well, Chris, this goes to some of the listener questions, right, that we had about mm -hmm. uh, deck building groups, right? Sure. Um, yeah. The question is like, I mean, I'll just briefly, uh, like I'm part of a bigger deck, build, uh, deck building group, the New York and Canadian people. We didn't have the best information coming out of Origins because none of us were fucking at Origins, right? Yes, yeah, Sandy was, and he uh, was too drunk and yeah, got yeah, fucking, yeah, Sand <laughs> and, and he got Seth's deck wrong. How the fuck do you get Seth's deck wrong? You had yes. one job. <laughs> like yeah like we had bad Find information out. from sandy like this is the thing i turned i actually turned to aaron broderick and i said look sandy was at fucking origins and didn't say there was any brathian at fucking origins like why did like why are you telling me now that barra was the the deck to worry about at at gen con like there, like there are things like this that happen right that even if you put the work in and the new york and canadian people put the work in we had for example aaron stark deck that he was running around at regional and star championship season with we had that deck Right, and and these are the kind of things that when you are plugged into these kind of groups that SoCal has and the Swedes have, and and and. Uh, well, I'm not I'm not criticizing the people who weren't there. I'm criticizing the 200 people who were at Gen Con and didn't watch the top eight. So like Joe from Cincinnati made that post where he's like, "Yeah, I went two and two at Gen Con or two and three, and I dropped, and then I played these games against JC Wem, and I really learned a lot." And it's like, yeah, well, you would have learned a lot more if you came and watched the top eight and learned all the top eight decks instead. Like, people, their focus is is misconstrued. Thrones is at this point, like, 1.0 wasn't. 1.0 I sat and watched until the finals all the time. But in second edition, like, I don't like the game as much, so it's very often a thing I do before I go drink. <laughs> it's just the truth. And I, I think it depends on it, it depends on where you are. I mean, I'll, even a, a regional in California, the finals, you'll have 15 people just hovering watching it. You'll you'll have everyone watching top four. It's it's because you're good. And, well, it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it's like a chicken or the egg scenario, but but it it's definitely the nature of the meta is we want to see not only what people are playing but how they're playing it. We want to see the drama of it as well as is exciting, right? You, you travel to these places, you want to see how they end up. Um, I rarely walk away from like a world's final until, until I've seen the final. Like I'm always there, you know, behind the rope, <laughs> kind of looking over everybody because I, I want to be there, right? I want I, I want to experience it. And I think Seth is onto something there. If he's the only person at Origins walking around watching these final games, I think that might say something about about a lot of the metas. Um, maybe there isn't that much interest, really. Like people say, like, oh, oh yeah, we want to be competitive, but. If you're just like, oh, yeah, I played, and then I didn't do well, so I went and, you know, hung out at the bar, did other things, that's fine. But but if you want to be in the top eight, if I you think want you to be do a first need to take the extra step. If you want to be a first if you want to be a first edition elitist, you need to act like a first edition elitist. I think <laughs> right. that's right. All right, well, let's let show all talk. That plays into my point, though, Aaron. I mean, it's, it's a reasonable point, but it also plays into my point, which is this, that in first edition – Nobody knew about the game. Like, relatively few people knew about Thrones the game. So if you were playing it, it meant you played it pretty, like, on a pretty big level, regardless of how good you actually were at it. You were pretty serious about the game. And so there were naturally more kind of students of the game, if you will. Whereas now we're seeing this huge influx of players. And if we get, for every 10 new players, we're not going to get eight students of the game, we're going to get maybe one to two students of the game, four mid-range players, and then five or six people who are like, oh, this is a fun thing to do on the weekends or maybe at my local game store. And hey, there's a convention down in Indianapolis that's only an hour from me. I'll, I'll drive down there. So I think, that, I think that as we see the expansion of the game, 
the the tiers of players are naturally going to stratify more. Yeah, I dig that. You know who I thought of, and I'm not going to like say a lot about it because I think he's actually good. But like, a lot of this reminded me of Corey Gulch. Remember the utter shock in first edition when someone we didn't know, like one Gen Con. Just me? Because I remember all of us being completely shocked. I have that, no like, comment so... on that Gen Con. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, I, you shouldn't. <laughs> uh, but, like, genuinely, if it was someone outside of the ordinary, someone who didn't, like, obsess about the game, who won, everyone was like, wait, what, really? And now... I mean, like, there's all these huge tournaments where you've heard of no one, and you have no idea if any of those people are any good. And then, like, if you're a new player, you've heard these other people are good, but, like, someone's dominating your local meta. Do you assume that they're genuinely better than, like, local guy X? Like, if you didn't play first edition, do you assume that, like, one of you guys, if you're just from a local new meta, is better than their best player? And why? We need to ask a new player. We're all old. <laughs> We've all been around too long. We're like, I, think, I, I am the closest thing to a new player that's here. So, I really. Yeah, but well, you're in an old back. meta. I let know. me bring it back to to Barberg, which is our initial question. So, I wanted to give that credit to Tomas for how he performed in his deck and how he did. But I also wanted to contextualize it for people who got so excited. This is a 40 some person tournament. Like, the dude did the best that he could at a tournament that was not Stalek, Worlds, Gen Con. It wasn't the tourney of the hand. So as a competitive player, you read into it and you strip away the fact that there was a good commentary and there was a stream and you think, how much does this really mean? Okay, And there was a world champion there. Let's be real. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, it was. I'm not saying it was not a competitive event. It's just not a meta-defining event. Yeah. Uh, sure. Keep in mind... He has been on many Road to Stalex and made the cut with this deck right. all throughout the year, and now he wins. That's also a big thing, I think. I agree. Yeah, he was in the top eight in the one you won, right? In France. In Tourneau right? de la Monde, yeah. yeah. Didn't you beat him? Uh, yes, yes, I beat him in the top eight, yeah. And you claimed it was extraordinary luck. Uh, I, I found the right coach, yeah. yeah. Basically. Because that was like the first Second Sons or the second Second Sons. No, 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 that... No, I didn't beat him, I think. I had Gwerik. Um, right, okay, yeah, yeah, eight. you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I do get what Seth is saying, though. Yeah. That, that we... He's not trying to take anything away from Tomas by any means. He's just saying we shouldn't extract too much out of it, which I only half agree with because... Uh, Despite the fact that it was only a 40-person tournament, the production values mean that it was seen by a lot of people. And you know, as well as anybody said, that the Thrones community, perception is reality. People see a deck do well, don't really take the context into consideration. So you and I may kind of put it lower down on the rung. But people are going to start looking at those decks now, and it's going to change the meta, whether that's a, a true representation of how good the deck is or not. So, uh, and a lot of it comes to, it was a, like, while there weren't a lot of people there, there were a lot of very strong players. Like, what means more, winning a 100-person tournament with literally no one you've ever heard, or winning a 60-person tournament where you know 40 of the players? I feel like that just feeds into my point. I played in a store championship this year where the players were me, Eric, Kid, Sam Bratz. Like, you have a tournament with four of these big name players nobody pays attention because it doesn't have the publicity it doesn't have the coverage that's my point i guess i would say more than i mean so you guys have corrected me tomas like it is in some ways meta defining because of how good he is how good the field is and that this deck is this is not the first rodeo for him playing that deck there's a lot of time he put in and you're getting that demonstrated but it's when people come in after the fact and comment and say this guy really discovered how to play a pseudo control deck and it's like, well, okay, look back. And there's a lot more evidence of that that you can learn from. You're just taking only the lowest hanging fruit and trying to learn from that. And you're 
limiting your development because of it. I think. Go ahead, Buzz. Yeah, we we had a uh, semi pseudo control deck uh, in the first big tournament that won it, and it was uh, Sam Bratz. So sure. it's been around forever in I this mean, game. Stroms won a launch tournament with a, a control deck. Like they were here, they've been here. The stupid Night's Watch banner of the Kraken and Lion. There's control decks. Mm -hmm. I think. So I think this, this comes. An interesting oh, thing that. Uh, sorry, my point is somewhat divergent, Roy. So if you want to go ahead, you can. No, go ahead, Chris. Uh, it, it feeds into an interesting thing um, that I'd been following today on Twitter. Uh, some of the the Magic pros were bantering back and forth. They had their World Championship last weekend or a couple weekends ago. Uh, and the guy who won it uh, received his invitation to that tournament uh, via a route that some people considered maybe questionable in terms of skill. And so there was sort of a back and forth argument as to whether it's better to have uh, basically a, a narrative versus absolute skill and which is better for the game. So if we had worlds every week of the year if we had a world's quality tournament with as many players as we get at worlds and the quality of those players how often would you want the absolute best player to win that tournament would you want them to win it 50 percent of the time would you want them to win it 80 percent of the time and where where in there do you want the narrative of the underdog and how much is that worth i mean we answered that for ourselves at gen con didn't we like where we all like all the first edition players kind of look at each other and like, can one of us fucking take it down? Just someone. <laughs> like we all sat in a circle and we're like, one of us is fucking winning. And like as we left, we were like, one of you assholes, do this. And like like we answered that yes, we want the best players to win. Like and I guess I just I, care. But I don't think win. Nate. But I don't think well, I don't think Nate necessarily does. I don't think the design team necessarily does, and that's why they introduce sure. such high variant stuff into the game. Like, Worlds could easily have been decided by a Gregor pull at some point, right? Or a Gen Con or whatever. So we want the best, while the design team, FFG itself, does not seem to. But but we, as this group, we're uh, all like, pretty much Jamie's. I, I don't know if we necessarily represent the community at large, even. Sure, uh, but... Somebody, but, somebody but, in the but, chat made the point that part of the reason that Tomas is being hailed is because we're so desperate for a non lanny success story. And, and you know, that... That plays into it, and that's narrative. That's not necessarily results. Yeah, but if you're smart about being desperate for a non laney success story, you look at the Kevin G deck makes top eight. I mean, clowns Star on uh, Lanny decks. A Stark deck, clowns on Lanny decks made top four. Martell uh, Wolf, clowns on Lanny decks makes top four. Like, if you actually gave a shit about beating Lanny, Lanny would be beat. I've, I've been saying that since well, the pre gen I mean, episode. Seth came very close to beating Lannister. Uh, there were anti Lannister decks. Yeah, like, but you know what? I bet Seth beat Gen Lannister. Con. I bet Seth beat Lannister multiple times during. I've the day. avoided saying that, but yes, I did yeah. beat a lot of like, Lannister. Like, <laughs> like I mean, but like th that's the thing, right? Like this is not shitting on Chris's victory, right? Chris played that right. game really well, and so did Seth. Like it was a great game, one of the one of the really good games played in 2016. But stop qualifying. What? <laughs> but my point is this: like you can fucking beat Lannister. Like this, yeah, I mean, because yeah. there's there's a fucking Venn diagram of these things, right? There's f size of the tournament, famous people that are there, right? And where the and then production quality slash promotion, right? And they well, don't awesome. always there's overlap there's in diagram. very useful I, ways. I don't think it's a very good Venn diagram. <laughs> well, but do you understand what I'm saying? Like, or my point that I'm trying to make is like these three qualities that people look at at Thrones tournaments don't always overlap. Right, sure. where sometimes tournaments that don't have the best players or have the best decks get a lot of attention, and that shapes the meta. And or sometimes a tournament that has a lot of famous names, like Seth points to the rained out baseball game store championship in DC, right, where all these world champions showed up. And uh, you know, it's like it's only one because the baseball game was rained out. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. Maybe it was. I don't remember. Um, great. That's a great narrative, right? Like, like, but people. I will say though, this that. is a great part. Kid and Sam flew into town to play in a Magic Grand Prix, and they got clowned on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 
like yeah. th- like there's the, like there's no science like we, we this is something that's come back again and again i think in second son's episodes is that there's no science to the way in which the meta is viewed and thrones is viewed as a, com- a competitive game because and we that, choose to not use science to do it i think that's that's point Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, I agree with that there. Like, I'm we just... choose to not study the top eight. We choose to obsess over production value and act as if sure. Okay, but so we also choose like the. A lot of that is also that the community is largely adults that have jobs and kids and like, et cetera. And so a lot of people are casual, which is fine. But like when you're casual and you can't manage to be Lannister and you don't look around to be Lannister, you have to understand that you've made that decision. And I feel like the community at large does not understand that they've made a decision to not be able to beat Lannister. Well, it's not true. that it's unbeatable. Sure. I think I know they just, we've they wrapped play up Lannister, a topic. That's we've wrapped up a topic, and I can see that Andreas is watching videos. I'm not sure if they're <laughs> WoW videos. I'm following the chat. He's playing WoW. He's actually right reading. No, no, he, he's Nothing. probably watching. The, the international is over, so it's a little yeah. less obvious that he's doing other things uh all right so then we have listener questions uh that have been saved up both for this week well I, there's and... a couple other things oh, oh go ahead Tuck. so really quickly i just want to respond to the question that uh okay targ put up here which That's is buzz. yeah well he's the man i mean he's, he's a pro um so how could we have studied the gen con top eight especially if you weren't there so my point was not that every single competitive player should know what was going on in the top eight my point eh. was there were so many people there, and so many of them did not pay attention to the top eight. It's not about the guy who wasn't there and had no way to find out. It's about the guy who thinks he's competitive, was there, and choose he chose to wander off and do something else instead of study the top eight. So that's my point, I guess. Okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about was there were two other tournaments. I think it was really interesting as a foil to Varberg, which is there were two other 40-some person tournaments uh, just after that, which was the Canadian Nationals and the one in Minnesota. And neither of them got the same amount of attention, probably, again, because of the production value. Um, what, do we, what do we think about that, guys, the results there and the tournament? I mean, King of the North got a pretty decent amount of attention for an unstreamed tournament. I mean, a lot of that was Ryan's specific promotional that's, efforts. That was definitely all Coolio, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean Cameron won with Stark, and I <laughs> what, think this what is, else is there? like I mean, but I think to be completely honest, like Cameron is one of the best Stark players. Do we know yeah. that though? Like that's kind of we kind of I mean, assume did, that. Like let's see how he did well in the Worlds last year, like in second edition. Like yeah, he, that was a like at, practically at long term. I'm not saying he's bad because who the fuck knows, but like let's see Worlds this year when like he well, might be bad. Be there because he ever good in first edition. Was Cameron ever good? In, let me just balance back up. <laughs> like, I'm not saying he is bad, but he yeah, definitely but might like, be bad. <laughs> right, exactly, right? Like, like he's winning a bunch of shit in the middle of Minnesota. Congratulations, but like... Eh. Have we heard of anyone else from Minnesota? Really? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, know... Kid, I kid know was that. at that tournament, right? Yeah, Kid was there. Kid, kid, and was, Sam kid, was, there kid was not there, but Sam was. Oh, Sam, Sam, was. Sam was. Sam was there. And Sam Nick was the... there. Nick Hansen, he's good. He was there. But they just played... Um, I, I think they just played kind of junky decks. And they both made top eight. Sam plays junky decks at everything, but that's not fair to say. Played a junky deck at Worlds last year and did all right with it. Yeah. yeah. Here, yeah. Well, I, he's really... And no one said he... Look, we know Sam is good. But, like, he definitely basically always plays junky decks except for that first Worlds. What? What do you mean? Junkie decks. He, he plays great decks. So <laughs> Sam will. Sam always plays. He's always going to take a, a theme, a notion, and run with it as opposed mm-hmm. to build a good deck. It's just for certain larger tournaments, he's tested that deck a lot more than others. So like his deck at Worlds, he's tested that over multiple months. The deck he played in Minnesota, he may have tested that over multiple hours. <laughs> <laughs> thank you I think, that's basically I think, what I'm trying to get at yeah I mean because the key thing is like a lot of people try to export the success of Sam's world's cha- world champion deck and failed uh, to export the success miserably compare that to for example the last first edition before uh, uh, Jakob won the, um, the, the Lanny Darkwing Stark Words deck right that was exported to pretty great success in first edition right 
Um, it's just sort of a boilerplate good deck once you have it. Unlike I also Sands. posted. I mean, I posted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you posted. No, I posted I, I, it a year later <laughs> after everything was banned. My deck from Fincon versus Canada <laughs> Nationals with, with what five of that deck in top eight? Like, yeah, yeah. It's just a yeah. stock good deck. Like, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm a uh, deck building master by any means. Yeah, I mean, Sean was. Well, in I think the top honestly, two. I honestly bet. Chris, that a lot of those top five decks, the ones that did the best, were probably more different from yours because you had, had more of a take all comers deck. I bet there was a lot of March first snow in those sure. top five decks. That could be, yeah. And I saw, I saw definitely one of the, the deck that actually won had some some real different stuff, and it had like the Crone from uh, Target in it, and I was what? like, yeah, the Crone was on the board at one point. I had no idea what it was doing there. I mean, sometimes <laughs> you make bad decisions and still win. <laughs> Crone is fun in melee. Yeah, okay. Yes. But it also should not be in your I want to win a tournament joust deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun deck in melee, though. Uh, okay, so any sort of general current meta competitive scene thoughts before we move on specifically to listener questions? I'm still kind of bored. I feel like it's still kind of rock, paper, scissors, but it's getting it's getting better. I feel like uh, I feel like someone like Bori or uh, or Jakob or someone's going to break Valor, which will more or less make the game enjoyable. All right. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be out in time for Worlds with the product delays. <laughs> is that our next topic? Uh, I mean, if you'd like it we, to. It can it be. Is, like, if, we, if people want to let a mutual, like, moan through space and time about product <laughs> delays, like, I, this is the problem we run into. Like, what the fuck do we say about product delays? So, I mean, I, I where's my chapter pack? pack? I have one thing to say. They just apologize and said they do one. better. And um, this is all I have to say. They have just apologized publicly and said they do better, only to follow that immediately by doing worse. All right. Like, so that's not even two weeks later. Oh, no, no. That was your one point, Aaron. That was the comment. So, <laughs> you did say so one. So anyone else? You got one point. You said you had one point. Uh, I'll say that OP promised to do better, and, I, and I'm not sure these delays are the fault of OP. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but, but OP could step in, and hopefully, I hope they see an opportunity to kind of gain some points by by addressing the community. I mean, I, I think they should uh, help out everyone going to Worlds and make it really clear what's going to be legal. Uh, like, if they don't know, uh, they've got their 11 days, and know everyone, uh, not everyone, a lot of people are like, well, they said 11 really days. brilliant topic, so, and we'll go in the bathroom real yeah. quick. They're like, <laughs> whatever, whatever, you know, comes out before the 11 days, that's what's legal. That, that's great. Um, if you don't like to test decks or don't plan on testing decks for worlds, but if you Second are, place, Seth can go to the bathroom. Oh. I'm gonna get another. Yeah, everyone's going. Yeah, go ahead, go piss, <laughs> bastards. All right. But, Lu Lucas for Lucas, hope shines eternal in the GOP. That's right. It does. No, it doesn't. It doesn't really. So and then just let it go. You gotta I just start. Want them you, you've got a little. Something. You've got kids. Just. Well, start I mean, let's say that is. This is a listener question, so let's save some of this for for right. when we have. We can answer it now. Like, listeners can figure out what's happening when. Or they can't follow the podcast and stop listening. Who really cares? <laughs> we have right. our we, we have our sure. loyal viewers. Yeah. Right. My, my point is short. I just want to know. So, so, do you think Valor's going to be legal for Worlds? Yes or no? No. No. For Starlick, yes. Oh. It's a, it's a, it's a Starlick is right a there. month later, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not a full month later, though, right? It's still in November. Yeah. Like, yeah, but, uh, three weeks. Yeah, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be so confident. <laughs> the rumors are I'm we're not getting it back at all this month, so I wouldn't be so confident. Um, this, is, this is the second year in a row they've done this with Worlds, isn't it? Like, last year, we they were like, we're going to give you a fact for Worlds, and they didn't until the last minute. Yeah, and that's the other thing that I think a lot of people aren't talking about is, are we going to have an FAQ? We don't know yet. Um, yeah. Roy, we're still talking about is Valor going to be legal for Worlds in case you're curious. No, I am I'm always curious. Uh, I'm sorry I missed Sid's insightful comments. I oh, really yeah, did just great. disappear. I'm sure they were. <laughs> you're, you're quite brilliant, Sid. Uh, I would bet it probably won't be at this point. I'm going to just say. There's just a bad, I have a bad feeling, one might say, about whether or not Valor is going to be legal. But I, mean, I won't be at Worlds this year, sadly, so... It's the fourteenth. I, I don't foresee a scenario where it's going to be legal. I just don't. I don't see it. Right. M my wish is so, for it to be legal, and a non-valor deck crushes it and wins, <laughs> so that people can <laughs> shut the fuck up. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, that sounds. That sounds. Stalic like doesn't have the 14-day rule, right? So whatever's available, whatever's in your available in Europe is legal, right? Like what? Well, what is the? They they will they will take a decision, but they can decide whatever they want, basically. And I think uh, if there is possibility for Valor to be available, they will jump on it. Sure, that yeah. makes sense. Okay. All right, so, are we actually ready to move on to listener questions, which have yes. been brewing for a while? I think so. All right. Do it. Chris, you got right. it. So we have three categories of listener questions. We have uh, deck and strategy questions. We have tournament and organized play questions. And we have uh, meta questions, so stuff about second sons. And we have an equal number of each. So where would you guys like to start? Let's start with us. All right, let's start with us. Uh, softball question from Greg. Who is replacing Glazer now that he has quit the game? Uh, <laughs> no I, one. I good riddance. I will never stop, <laughs> I will never stop talking <laughs> shit whether I ever play again or not. All right. <laughs> that answers that question. No one, right. by the way, on the pure technical side, no one is replacing Glazer. Uh, I'll miss the easy wins, but I'll get over it. <laughs> oh, you mean for people who forget oh. no quarter, right? Oh. Oh, my God. Whatever, at that Gen Con, right before then, I beat him, and he dropped. <laughs> That's our last game, I think. I don't think we played since. I remember that. I just remember all those cuts I made. <laughs> <laughs> eh. All right, next question. next question. All right, moving along, uh, let's go to Dex and Strategy. Uh, Scantro would like to know, does Night's Watch Kings of Winter need the wall? Uh, That's the most Scantrell question ever. I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, Night's Watch Kings of Winter shouldn't even run the wall. I have right. a terrible because... premise. Mm. Let me ask you some specific <laughs> questions about this premise. <laughs> I only well... want to play Raiders. <laughs> Should I play more Raiders? <laughs> Less Raiders. Um, but Aaron, oh. what, what's, what, what is the Night's Watch Kings of Winter? I, am, I have no clue. But I, I, because... I am going I'm going to assume what Scantrell is intending is something built around the uh, the three gold location that's name escapes me right, right the now. White like just choke, choke right? A choke. Okay, yeah, so exactly. so then I think you can play the wall because uh, at, or... in in Poland when I made the top sixteen I wasn't the best Night's Watch. Sadly, there was another Night's Watch Lion, and it was completely different from from the one I got from Sam. Uh, and he ran the wall, and he he crushed it all I day. I knew Sam gave you that that, that traitorous <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> so all the skeletons are falling out of the closet tonight. The, so the second when we were a wait sample size and B Lannister is gold. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, while uh, while we were still recording last time, uh, the second Seth said that Sam had a Night's Watch lion deck. I immediately wrote to Sam, said, I need the deck. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's your fault, huh? What a you whore. Betrayed DC. <laughs> Sam just wants to be loved, unlike all the other Wasa and DC people. Sam just, everyone he loves does. Sam. He does. He just wants love. <laughs> <laughs> so, so following That's what in, makes Sam so great. <laughs> following in the model of the last question, as Seth will amusingly point out, he would also like to know, is Tyrell Knights better with Lords of the Crossing or Kings of Summer? Uh, Lords of the Crossing, Crossing and, it's still, and it's still actually good. I don't That's think it's tough. That brings good. me back to the question of my favorite AAA baseball team. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. If, you're, no like, if you're not that good and you want to take a deck that might just get lucky and win some games, it's not bad. Sure. I hope you like, can time... Uh, the that blanking plot really well though when they first snow you have yeah. your board off. <laughs> um, we we you can did run into a meta with no first snow, which is sometimes it does sometimes happen. Like John's melee deck is really fun and just. It's really fucking fun in melee too. Let me tell you. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't care about that. <laughs> is that list posted anywhere? Aaron? Uh, yes, yeah, he posted it. It's up. Uh, both, it's both it's John and I posted it. Nice. Okay. It, it, it was the I, second best melee deck in the tournament after my melee deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you couldn't. You couldn't have won melee. Plot Not enough DC played. My copy of Naval Superiority 
Uh, what did you cut from the plot deck to put? Because you would have been in the cut, by the way, Seth, if you had played your your last game. I did I the math. Like if you had come in second in the la in the in your last game, you would have been in the cut. If you hadn't dropped, man. If you hadn't gone to play D and D. Speaking of someone who does not take Thrones competitively serious, there's this guy sitting <laughs> low who uh, dropped out of me. the melee and then didn't watch the final melee game. Hey, Roy, right. you don't want to do D and D. Roy, yeah, you're upset. Yeah, what the melee meta is like now. Wait, Chris, you care about this. Chris, time out. I learned uh, a lot. We're upsetting this podcast's favorite player that's not on the podcast, Johnny Wright, because if Roy doesn't do his rant now, he's going to hang out with his wife. Well, he can go hang out with his wife, because you guys miss them making fun of my love for my girlfriend. I'm a firm believer in loving your spouse or partner, so I think Johnny should go off and, and spend time with his wife over listening to uh, us. I mean, we got time. We're in, the, we're in between questions. I say we do the rant now and let Johnny stay. I don't have a rant. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is the thing. Although, like, I have killed my six-pack. This is my last beer. Uh, Ooh. Oh, yeah. So you're saying you're okay with ideas like not having these tournaments? for tournament? in for inclusivi For inclusivity? I couldn't get that word out. Sorry, it's late. If you want to hear my thoughts, you can just hear them in your head and read them in that Facebook thread that I spent, like, all my fucking day yesterday replying to a bunch of assholes uh about so like if you want my opinion you can do that like could you name, could you name those assholes for us no i'm because i can't <laughs> honestly remember who they were so that just shows you because they weren't any of the normal trolls so but i actually Roy, have a point Roy, do me i have a very important rant on this topic sorry buzz i don't want to cut you off i'll save my rant right here for a moment <laughs> one second Roy, link me the Facebook thing. I, I, I love drama. I need to. Oh, no. <laughs> right, you really do. We, don't want to your we were waiting for you like all day. We were like, where the fuck is Buzz? <laughs> I was working. Sleeping. Sleeping, Buzz. Yeah. Sleeping. Working so or rant, playing well. My rant is this. And this is why we have a bad community. If you made a post on that thread and you were at Origins or Gen Con and did not write down the top eight decks, <laughs> I will be... Circling back. I will be beating you <laughs> at Worlds and other events in the near future. Like, why do we get 200 comments on that thread and nobody wants to talk about decks? It's fucking absurd. What, what this community, like, this is why we need a player of the year. This is why we need something like that because all we have to talk, talk about right game. now... We just talk about social issues. We don't talk about right. the game in any meaningful way. I mean, if the game was fun. Talk about practice, not, not a game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we? Next question. Roy, Roy has, has had oh, six beers. I think Roy is, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> time to move. Roy is done. Let's, let's move on to a tournament question. Uh is, uh, and this goes back to the topic we were discussing earlier, so it may be a short discussion. Uh, Abe Froman would like to know, is a North American player-run ter community tournament feasible? No. Maybe. We're too spread out. I like, I like Roy's answer much better You're than You're too Aaron's. spread out? <laughs> uh, I what? Think it can. I think it can happen. It could happen. Well, you know yeah. the map, like the way the globe is constructed. I could I could bore you with a history lecture about it. Like Europe is actually much smaller. I know. Than <laughs> North America is. I know. So doesn't matter. People will travel. <laughs> no, they won't. Further. You guys get. Yeah. You guys get. That more, is actually get more vacation time, and it costs significantly less money to travel. Like oh, I could. So change your country. Seriously. Well, okay. I get agree. more vacation. I, I, I do I'm not sure that's Northern how we Thrones. get a road uh, series. <laughs> yeah. no, I will be. Sure I will that's be, the actual solution we're looking for, Buzz. I will be writing what? letters to Jill Stein, uh, Hillary Clinton, <laughs> Donald Trump, and uh, Gary Johnson about their. Why well, I have two comments policy. here. One is, why <laughs> would we pull teeth and choose the most difficult option <laughs> when that's the point of this Player of the Year system, which is why? Why leverage. are those? I don't think those are mutually exclusive, though. Uh, I mean, no. I there's like a zero sum game for effort and energy within the community, and if you I put disagree. it towards a more difficult, well, I, I mean, I would love to be proven wrong. I would love to see a fucking badass North American Championship come to yeah. exist. I just don't have faith. Right. I mean, yeah, Seth, if right. if uh, if Europe didn't have Road to Starlight and Starlight, what would the uh, European uh, scene look like? It would be trash. 
Sure, but if you didn't have a lot that, like it does now, I just, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. But you didn't have anything before that. There weren't like real meaningful national championships with trips anywhere. There wasn't. Yeah, like, yeah we didn't North have Indian regionals in Sweden and stuff yeah, yeah. until two thousand and thirteen. Right. Yeah. So like that that existed in America means we didn't need to develop right. that sooner, and we I mean, sort of. Yeah. The problem you run into is right. Like some fan groups will put on like tournaments that they spend hundreds of dollars on prize support for. You know, they put it in a desirable location with lots of tourist events that you can bring your spouse who isn't interested in Thrones or your partner, right? And people from like four and a half to five hours with affordable train and bus rides, they won't come to your tournament, uh, despite the fact that you know that there's going to be top level players there. I, that I have believe social that connections. Roy, Roy is talking shit about DC, <laughs> Seth. Just in case you uh, missed that, that's aimed at uh, you. Uh, you know, th that they'll do things where there's this really nice trophy that people will put, you know, plaque on, and there's, like, top-level players from as far away as Canada come down to this tournament. Four of your tournaments in a row, we just gave up on driving up there. <laughs> oh, okay, I see how this goes. Okay, that's fine. That's but, fine. Okay, so you have the, like, uh, distance thing, but you have to keep in mind that, let's say, uh, Bataya is 250 people. Maybe 210, 220 are Spanish. The rest are travelers. It's mostly the people around, like, in the bigger part of the state that travels there for this one big event per year. So, I mean, you can make big community events, like uh, Kublacon is stuff like that, right? So I'll put it like this. I have, I know... I know I have a finite amount of time to commit to community development. That's not where I'll put my energy. I would love for it to happen. I will travel to those events and I will support them if they go off the ground. But I, I feel like because that's the harder road, I'm going to start easier first and then I'd rather double back once we get somewhere. And I want to answer really quick, OK, Targ, again, my man Buzz is asking good questions. <laughs> yeah. He asks about all these different platforms, we don't have a good community internet-based platform to discuss topics. We are split between Facebook, which has its own issues, and CardGameDB, and it got Cards is now dead. So how do we solve this? I think the bigger issue... I think the bigger issue, as I see it, and you guys, I'd love to hear your stance, is we have less to talk about. We just don't have anything to talk about. And that's one of the reasons I think a player of the year, a chart that's sort of universal, is valuable. Because everybody has the same thing to talk about. Um, we have gross how much I agree with you today. Uh, we have <laughs> announcements coming up after Stalic, I think, um, concerning this and sites like Agard Cards. By the way, Agard I'm not sure exists. if I know, but uh, <laughs> I have a website getting built. Well, it's, it's, how do you... it's it's finished. We just haven't to... launched. Fill it, yeah, and we My will. How do we, 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 we will Everyone launch it after, after 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 Stalic. The problem is getting promoted heavily here. Forever right. though. <laughs> the problem is getting any website ever. can compete yeah. with Facebook. Facebook has the advantage that everybody's there anyway, but it has Except the disadvantage that it disincentivizes meaningful conversations. So it puts us in this trap where everybody's there, so it becomes the status quo. But it's a terrible medium, so it helps to ruin our community. But if we had something more concrete to talk about and work around deck lists or something, you mean they got cards, right? If but Facebook kind of undermined they got cards. No, they got cards. Never updating undermined they got cards. I, I, got I cards think it's a combination a, of the two. No, I don't think so at all. I think if they got cards updated in a timely manner, it would still be the hub. It was that it took like what, six months into the game existing before they even put up the cards, they never established a good deck builder? Right, like, I yeah. think it would have been fine. It's just that it's just never updated. Because, like, people would have done what we did in first edition. It just would have been in a larger scale where it would have been like, hey, where do people talk about this game seriously? And everyone would have said, well, yeah, it got cards. And just or to ever... say, Buzz, I would love for a new site to succeed. I would love for a new professional site to come out. Not professional, but a new centralized site to come out and succeed. I just, I feel like if we don't have something more universal to talk about, it can't succeed. So the title of tonight's episode is Seth is Skeptical About Stuff. <laughs> skeptical <laughs> Seth. There we go. That will probably be the title of the episode when I edit it tomorrow morning. So, 
All right. Well, so well, tomorrow, uh, today, uh, today our questions. We're back to the uh, meta question section. Uh, Joe from Cincinnati would like to know who is the most Cincinnati. overrated host on Second Sons. We we have ratings. Like I don't know who's rated. So who's overrated? What's the criteria? Aaron. <laughs> oh, I mean that's what okay. that was the implication. Yeah, I can live with it. I assume gameplay <laughs> is the, the implication here, not as a person. Oh, I don't know. Oh, oh definitely me. I, mean, I, I think it's I, definitely me. For no, sure. I mean, you're talking about gameplay. The worst player here is me. <laughs> it's literally yeah, but, like, but Roy, we we know that you're the worst player. We don't rate <laughs> you high, right? We we don't hype your your stuff. Right. Yeah. We're we're, we're happy when it goes well for you, but we don't we don't assume you will do well at the <laughs> tournament. So you're not overrated. You're rated just right, right? That's true. Thank you. That's right. We should have a host tournament one day that Buzz can stream. We can all play each other in a bunch of games, round robin. <laughs> Seth, you're that not. That sounds invited. exhausting and humiliating. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so the 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 technical answer is Glazer. That's what Joe wants to hear. So let's just say it. Since since by the way, an achievement as I said in chat, achievement was unlocked. Someone who wasn't Aaron talked shit about Joe on the podcast, and that was Seth. We so need make, we need to make the official drinking game next episode. We're I feel I do feel like game. it's Luke, and the reason I feel like that is the case is because you basically publicized the first good Lanny deck, <laughs> counting coppers, <laughs> and you were like, thing. "Oh, it has this no. theme. It's really good." And everybody's like, "Man, this Lanny deck is really good." <laughs> it's true. All right. Well, that was a nice softball for us. Uh, we'll move back to the decks and strategy strategy section. Uh, Gabe asked on Facebook of me specifically. I saw you played Bear a Lion at Siege of High Garden, which was a uh, tournament held in Northern California on Labor Day weekend. It was a lot of fun. Uh, he said, "How do you like the deck, and would you make any changes?" Uh, well, I went two and three at what I would basically consider a local. Uh, so I can't say that I'm <laughs> especially happy with my performance with it. Uh, I don't think the deck is that great right now, and I would not recommend playing it uh, without, without a, a serious overhaul. Uh, there's some story as to why I ended, up, you know, I, uh, I ended up, we were planning on leaving at about 10 or noon for Northern California, which is a six to eight hour drive. Ended up leaving at two. I'm which bad, I'm people. bad, I'm bad. Sorry, oh, continue. I... Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, I'm just, Awful. If he's uh, bad, what does that make you? LA rush hour traffic. And uh, so the time I would have had to deck build, I instead spent on the road and threw something together in a very ill advised manner at about 2 a.m. in the hotel room. So, uh, not the best uh, preparation on my part, I will freely admit. Uh, so, I would not recommend you play that deck at all. <laughs> all right. Next. I'm, I'm leaving in like five minutes. I'm going to bed. Oh, let's see if there's anything especially controversial we can get to before Aaron leaves. That <laughs> seems like oh, <laughs> meta. We'll go back to the meta section because this this one will be good for Aaron. Uh, Brad Iyer would like to know: Was each host's claim to fame? Uh, Chris won Gen Con. Andreas won quote that Euro tournament. What about the rest? Uh, I guess Red Saturday. That is the biggest I mean, if tournament we're, if, won. If, if, if we're talking second edition. I, I was just on the first episode and then refused to leave. So it's like, <laughs> you were on <laughs> no, 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 really. the second episode, Sid. You made, you made the was it the second? It was the second. No, the no, you was... guys had me on the first, and, no. and Dark Knight no, no, didn't no. show up, and you're like, no, ah, Dark Knight was actually on the first. The first was fucking oh. terrible. Did anybody um, listen to the first? I didn't think. The first one was like the it's first. It's actually the highest downloaded it's episode. Like, it's like the first <laughs> pilot of Star Trek that nobody's seen that has a different <laughs> captain. Yeah, basically. Yeah, your claim to fame was you came on for the jumper that like is still my favorite deck in uh second edition so far. You won the big California tournament with the jumper deck. True. Yeah, you did win a thirty-one person uh, store championship. I go to you. I go to Worlds every year. I just, I just down. I just I, I I go to Worlds and I just like knock off like a random DC player just for fun and then I then I don't make the cut. That's like my mo. Right, I'm not rising to, to that troll. Yeah. Technically, I've made more <laughs> Gen Con. Well, not technically. I've actually made more Gen Con top 16s than Aaron has. So. Yeah, I've Ooh. never. Gen Con's my worst tournament by far. I don't know why. So I made two. One in Melee and one in Joust. Um, I've always 
performed reasonably well at Worlds. I've always performed reasonably well at like everything else, just Gen Con for whatever reason. Not really. Like I finished like four well and two every year. year. Eh, it's okay. Hmm? So I have a question I want to pose to follow up Brad's question. He made a post on Facebook, or there was a there was a thread, a sub thread on on one of the Facebook posts about um, about where do you go to get good community deck advice? Where is the competitive discussion? Make and friends. It's not online. I feel like there is none, and yeah. I feel like that. I mean, our our game will atrophy if that continues to be the case. Isn't that sort of? I mean, that's a call for help. If people feel like I, I'm a burgeoning competitive player and I want to be good at this game, where do I go? And the answer is kind of nowhere. Then what do we got? I mean, can we be completely honest? Like from an online level, isn't that how it has always been? At least in my year and a half experience with the game. Like I went to online forums and didn't really learn that much. Uh, Scantrell did give really good skeleton decks. No, I don't mean this in a serious way. Like, I mean this really seriously. He gave really good skeleton decks. If you're like, oh, I'm interested in X deck, you could get a decent version of it from there. But I didn't actually start improving until I became friends with Dave Strom, Stan Struhall, and then Aaron Glazer. And then they ran me through my paces, and that's why I made the top 16 at Gen Con that past year. It was had nothing to do with an online presence. Like, that's how I made friends with Dave Bamford was you know, him and Seth fighting about what a good deck is, but it was never, like, I never gained any knowledge of the technical side of Thrones from its online component. Yeah, a lot of the legitimate answers you have to make friends. Like, if you're, like, terminally shy or you're not willing to, like, reach out and message people, like, a lot of good players um, will just literally make you a deck or critique your deck if you just send it to them. But very few people are actually going to go search CardGameDB and all these other sites to look for them to then comment. It's just not uh, worth the time. There's too yeah. many decks. Well, I think Agot cards actually used to give good deck advice. Like, just some, to, some, some of, of it. it. Not all of it, but yeah. there used to be, yeah. like, that was the place to but, go. It was a real place to go to have. Yeah, but you, yeah. you had to know who to listen to even then. Like, you had to know who to listen to. There was still random, like random weird shit happening there right even if you, even if we agree that it's no better now than it has ever been we have more new players now than that, that's why i tried there to have do been. The, so like that's let's why I tried to do the deck sharing thing something. that did work it did work it's better it is better than it was yeah it just I meant mean, when it come goes... to deck sharing on the sheer number of sure. winning decks that are shared it's better i think uh, the website is suboptimal for for deck sharing. Is there going to be another website, perhaps debuting after Stalic, that helps with that? Yes. <laughs> no. But no. Uh, there will be a website, but not for that, yeah. Uh, but I think... Uh, I think just sharing the deck on ThronesDB and then keep a document over it is simpler and more effective than white book website sadly um right but like but you guys know adam cola right australian player yeah, yeah, yeah. on all the yeah. boards yeah yeah like the other day he asked me for a deck i make it he asked john for a deck john makes it and then he's like what did you do this and john did that for like so john and i both ended up explaining like 16 deck choices to him for like an hour and guess what by the end of that i bet you he understood that deck a lot better than he did at the start you just have to reach out to people like, no one's going to do it for you. Much like sticking around to watch the top eight of a tournament. If no one's going to do it for you, put in the extra work or, I don't know, stay bad. Yeah, I've had a lot of people contact because me. Because I feel like sometimes people get gun shy because mm -hmm. they ask a certain person at a certain time and they get, well, I can't really talk about that because I've got such and such a tournament coming up. And Oh, yeah, i got to yell at you later, uh, so said Lasky. Bring, bring it on, bring it on. You're not yeah. infiltrating my group, Glazer. <laughs> <laughs> I know, answers like that kind of turn me off to wanting to just stick my neck out and ask for things. Um, but 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 I understand those concerns too. I don't expect people to be like, oh, here's all our tech. Um, <laughs> so it's a tough balance to between being welcoming and and being um, and and not sharing everything you know and everything you have. Yeah. The problem we also run into is compare like people often compare to the Thrones competitive scene to the Magic one. But the thing is, you going on and writing, say, a card game to be article about your awesome deck that you want to take to worlds, right? 
and how amazing it's going to be. If you do that on Channel Fireball, you get paid. Like if if you're like you make money doing that. Uh, if you do that in Thrones, you might get a little bit more famous in the community, but you don't get the only reason really people play this game at a highly competitive level, which is for the glory of the card designs. Those are the two reasons that you play. There's no other revenue, like there's an emotional revenue stream of founding podcasts and being part of podcasts, but there there's not like an actual thing besides glory and card designs. And so I think that's the tension that you run into with Thrones that's different than other competitive card games, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic, Pokemon, Poker, all mm -hmm. these other, other things. Yeah, deck building in poker is especially difficult. Well, yeah. <laughs> I meant Next, like strategy. We're talking about strategy. I know, I know. One more and I'm going to bed. Last one, go. All right. Shit, my phone uh, just died. Also, also another good controversial one from Brad Iyer. Is winning Stalic more impressive than winning <laughs> Worlds? Yeah, by far. Is anyone going to argue that? Like, seriously? Yes, it is. It's been bigger every year. There's a higher quantity and density of good players. Um, let's think about more impressive. Let's let's dig into it a little bit. At least have a little fun. So, <laughs> like, um, I can I can help you. It's go for it's, it. Because you've been the uh, both. Yeah, yeah. Worlds uh, does have something that Stalic doesn't as coverage. Because uh, we are at the castle in the middle of fucking nowhere, uh, so we don't have an internet <laughs> connection. I'm working on getting that fixed, but uh, there won't be streams. If the only info you'll get is via messages on Facebook and stuff like that. Worlds, you have commentated games. It's still a large tournament, even if it's not as big as Stalic. And there are good players, even if it's not as dense. So, I mean, it's impressive. Could be more impressive than Stalic. I don't know, but uh, you don't believe it. No, I like the word impressive. I I, I don't. I think Stalic is um, a harder tournament to win. Of course, it has to be. I, I mean, there's three hundred yeah. fucking people. Yeah, uh, it's three hundred, right? I think. I think the cap is at three hundred players or something. Um, but worlds can be a more impressive tournament because of the coverage because of the hype because of everything leading up i mean casual player that don't I mean, know about stalic the, the average american will know about worlds not everyone knows about stalic sure Pe okay. people play in a store championship and they know oh i can go and play at its regional with this buy i got and then with this buy uh, in regionals, I can go to nationals, and at nationals, I could get a buy at worlds. Everyone knows this. People know about worlds. It's like a thing, right? Yeah, but it, it's the thing if, you're, if you don't know better. Like, it depends on who you're trying to impress. Are you trying to impress us, or are you trying to impress a date? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're trying to impress a date by winning worlds, eh, whatever. But, like, I don't know, Shonthal, how many big Euros have you played? Because I I know I've played a lot. I don't know if Seth has played a lot. What, yeah. European players or tournaments? The big European players. Like, have you uh, played Jakob? Have you played Alcro? Have you played... I played Jakob in draft. I played Andreas at uh, War of the Five Kings last year, but that's about it. Um, I've played a bunch. I've, I've played I've casual played, games like, Alcro at Worlds. Yeah, but, like, so on. Um... And Alvaro doesn't actually take it easy in casual games. He's sort of... <laughs> but, um, but, like, having played a lot of the top players at both, like, the very top American players are as good as the very top European players, but there's so many goddamn more of the very top European players. Just sure. so many more. I don't agree with that. Yeah, I know, but you're wrong. <laughs> so I think, I mean, it. I think it varies a bit year to year. I think certain years... The comparison between the Stalic of that year and the Worlds of that year changes. Like, for example, so you can point out, I mean, you can make great arguments on both sides about how competitive the tournaments are. I mean, setting aside Brad's exact question, he really wants to know which is the more competitive tournament. So you can have an example like Alvaro. He makes Worlds, he wins the final table, he goes to the final table. He's not at the final table either year in Stalic. He's not even really that close. But then you he can made, make the he reverse. Made, he made top eight that year, I'm pretty sure, actually. 
Uh, I mean, that's different from winning, right? I mean, it's still. A... I mean, I don't know. Second, I don't know. Second place. Seth, I think you tell me. <laughs> I think I think that difference is overstated. I think, yeah. and maybe less so at one point but in in, in two point you know, I feel like it's kind of like magic, where top eights are what should be counting for people, whether they do or not. What should be counting for people are top eight. And then if you win, that's a bonus on top of that. But anything past top eight is going to be at least summed up to variance. And less so in Europe, to be honest, which is why I love that two out of three format. And I wish that more American tournaments would adopt it because that really, it really shows where the, where the rubber meets the road. So what do you say if I have a Stalic player who can make a final table but then misses the cut two years in a row at Worlds? I mean, what does that say? I mean, is... I don't know. Compared, compared to another player, though, I don't, I don't know where you're... Sure, that's... A, that's very specific, so you're looking at a sample size issue. But even beyond that, like, I don't know if such a player really exists. Almost all the top Europeans that come over place highly in our tournaments, right? No. It's Laplante. I mean, Laplante. Yeah, like, I was thinking about Laplante. He, yeah, he, he came, came second, and, and then the year after... In, in Stalic, he came second. And then in the year after... Uh, he missed the cut at Worlds. Not only did he come second in Stalic, he played the same deck. <laughs> he came to Worlds, missed the cut, went to Stalic, played the same deck. So I think there is, like, that's a year, for example, where it was closer. I think last year, Worlds was smaller. It's it's more distant. I mean, I, Stalic I was... Think, I mean, how many Euros were I still think that deck was the... I think that deck was the best deck at Worlds that year. It's just Garrick happens to play that's it better than LeBlanc did that day. If you say so. You can insist on your deck. You didn't beat it. <laughs> Alvaro did with a really, really amazing play. I was losing a Kevin Chi's deck again. He's a <laughs> real great player. That Kevin Chi. <laughs> Kevin Chi has come up a lot this cast. He, Seth is a big Kevin Chi plan. He I think the Stalic versus Worlds, that's an eternal debate. And the longer that debate continues, the healthier for the community. As long as we can keep arguing that, we're really, we're actually, like, that's an interesting debate to keep making. And it keeps that sort of European-North American rivalry going. I love that. Mm -hmm. it, it was the best part about Worlds, the, first, the only Worlds I've attended so far, was the Team Europe versus DC SoCal. Uh... It was a good storyline. Sure. It would sure. be nice anyway. if we could get more Americans going over there, though, because uh, yeah, be, yeah, that would give us a fuller picture of what's really happening. I mean, from... has an American actually Sandy. attended? Sandy, just, just Sandy. 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 He he had... Oh, yeah, that's so... right. He's the only one who's attended Stalic. <laughs> Not so... really. So <laughs> an Indian Sandy... national. <laughs> Sandy made a battalion. Americanized up. Indian national, right? No, 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 no. Indian... it wasn't a racial comment. It was, was he really attending, or did he just go to <laughs> drink in Europe? <laughs> Bad. What did he play? Bartavia? Mar Marathian, oh. yeah. Yeah, really? Okay. Yeah. He made the cut. He made the cut at Bataya that year. Yeah. You were there with him, right? No. I know I if didn't you were there with him. I went, to, I went to Blackwater. For the Worlds versus Stalic, impressive. I think uh, if you're at Stalic, you will understand why it's so impressive. It's such an amazing tournament. If you're not attending either of the tournaments, I think Worlds is clearly the more impressive. Uh, sure. and then you can, uh, then you can discuss which one is the most competitive. So, I think it's interesting to me because the strongest argument in favor of Stalic is its size, the sheer number of players. But Gen Con didn't really get that buzz. I mean, the tournament that you won, Chris, it was basically double the size of any other tournament other than the core set tournament. But sure. it doesn't really get that buzz like Stalic gets the buzz. It's so emotionally charged. That argument, because of the continentalism, is so charged. It's 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 just fascinating discussion. I mean, I'm, Gen Con. I'm not going to say too much, but I definitely think that it was a charged question to be asked. Uh, I, I think it was asked for that purpose, and <laughs> you did a good job at sort of mitigating that. <laughs> I think. Gen Con is in a weird position, though, in, I think, North America, right? Particularly now with the introduction of Origins. Like, it'll be interesting if Origins institutionalizes itself as a legitimate tournament, what becomes of Gen Con. Like, I mean, for me, it's emotionally charged because I was told by the amazing, the Thrones players who brought me up and taught me how to play competitive Thrones that Gen Con 
is what you aim for. And if you can go to Worlds, Worlds is the next step. But like most people can attend Gen Con because it's Gen Con, like just as a as a as a as a right. experience. Um, there's other things to do besides Thrones. You play your competitive Thrones, and you go and play Dungeons and Dragons, for example. All right, fuck um, this. I'm going to sleep. Good night, everybody. But, but Worlds is like the next step above that, but you may not be able to attend Worlds for a variety of logistical reasons. Um, it would be interesting to see what happens now that we firmly have a United States Nationals that's its own distinct tournament without a card design, but it's its own distinct tournament. It would be interesting to see what happens next year, in 2017. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was pretty similar to this year, to be quite honest. You know, it, you're right that it doesn't have a card design. Origins is uh, not nearly the convention that Gen Con is. No offense to anybody who loves Origins. I've, I've been to both multiple times, and I, I would pick Gen Con every time. Um, so I think, the, I think the numbers from this year, despite the fact that it was somewhat of an experiment, are actually pretty representative unless something major changes in the support from FFG from if they actively shift from one to another and somehow Origins gets a card design and Gen Con doesn't or something like that happens, then then everything's off the table. But, I, mean, but the weird... I think I think Origins being ninety to a hundred and Gen Con being tw twice that is probably gonna be the norm. All right, we're gonna move on to a new question. Fire away. All right, um, let's go with Jordan Deliski. Uh, sorry if I butchered your name there. Asked us, why are all versions of Renly in 2.0 bad? <laughs> uh, and he has a detailed explanation as to why the new one's bad, if we want to get into that. But I think it's a self-explanatory question. Uh, the new one's not bad? Okay, so, so maybe we do need to get into that. <laughs> Uh, if yeah. we're not going to agree on that. So, I mean, this is where we watched Glazer, the ultimate card reviewer, was here. Because Seth sure. is just going to yell about you should be watching Kevin Chi I mean, play. It's, it's so much <laughs> better than the old one. It uh, feels good. <laughs> it feels good when you see it. And you're like, ooh, yeah. three icons and renown. Mm, I've got renown. my Tyrell so, house well, cards. <laughs> yeah. Drawing yeah. that bomb. The short version of his post is he's the only king with a drawback that we've seen so far. Um, so. So it's already naturally worse. Um, That's Tyrell a terrible comment. What is that? Is the only necessarily king? Need draw to be to be competitive. They already had draw. Draw wasn't what they were missing. So giving them more of it isn't necessarily the answer. Um, and paying seven gold for a character that only has synergy with some of the worst characters and can't be saved in in certain cases, which. It's something I dislike as well. Um, I guess those are those are his main arguments there. Now I feel free to disagree with him. He has three icons, renown, and can draw you cards. And yes, there's a legitimate drawback that he can't be saved, but he still is has three icons and renown in a house that wants three icons and renown and good cards to play because it draws cards and manipulates its deck. And all these kind of other things. You should watch, listen to the White Book episode where Aaron and I talk a lot about how good Renly is, which so which will come out the day after this episode goes uh, becomes available. Oh, nice! We got a we got a Renly episode in coming. I'm excited. Well, we reviewed the chapter pack in the new White Book. Gotcha. And then his follow up to that was: as the card pool expands, what will it take to make Tyrell great? Assuming that greatness is achieved when the faction in question manages to be represented by two or more players in top sixteen of a good tournament. <laughs> Without causing shock. So basically, when what will it take to get Tyrell to a place where they're expected to do well in a tournament? Two good questions here. So the first question on Renly, I'm going to abstract that. Um, I think the question really is, why does FFG sometimes take a named unique character and refuse to print a good version of that named unique character? So if we abstract the question, first edition we have Robert Baratheon, where like, you just, he was never really that good by the end of the game. I mean, maybe you play one, but he's Shadow just not. Shadow Bob, Shadow Bob, they kept stand himself yeah, in, put the limit have... on. He was, he was restricted. I mean, okay. Oh, yeah. Double but, Renown, Bob? Good. He was solid. Jeez. Melee Bob, how about, how about Party Tywin? Bob? Tywin, Tywin, until Bob? they released the four-cost Tywin. 
So tie win for a long stretch of the game. I'll agree with you. And there's, there's other examples as well. And I think, they're, in, in my opinion, I think what happens often is they try and balance a named unique character against other named unique characters of the same name. And sometimes you just get a junk character that gets replicated junk <laughs> copies. That's interesting. A so bad the, first, or something. <laughs> the first Renly was unplayable. They were like, oh, we can't make this one so much better than the first one, even though he's in a different faction. Right. I mean, their objective is to make, well, they're all playable. They just have different uses. That's the objective of the design team. Sure. But if they're all kind of bad... <laughs> One slightly more playable than the other, right? But that, so but that both means the different. Question there, Seth. What do you think Tyrell needs to see a time when they are not a surprise to make top sixteen? Um, they need more control breaking. options, in my opinion. They they are an economy economic house. They have the draw. They have the economy. Uh, they just don't have anything to do with it yet, um, which is one of his. Uh, Concerns with this Renly, it's just more draw, in his opinion. Um, sure. They need more stuff like High, High Garden, I think. Or Valor. Valor could solve everything for them. I don't know. I think what they need is a combination of two things. One, good cards to be released, and two, to avoid the restricted list. I think if you look at Baratheon Hollow Hill in first edition, you had that confluence. More and more good cards are being released and they avoid the restricted list almost entirely. Not entirely, but close to entirely because they're not winning events. So at some point you reach this moment where there's good cards, they're not restricted, the house is good. I feel like Tyrell's kind of coming from behind right now, and eventually we will get there. Sure. Sid? Uh, I think that's an interesting point that maybe a restricted list is what it's going to take to get Tyrell to that point. I'm one of the people that do advocate a, restric a restricted list. Like two months ago, would have been nice if we if we would have gotten one. Um, like like the sooner the better at this point. And uh, I I think on on in the kind of the vein of like what good cards do they need? I think I like Buzz's comment more control, but they don't they don't, need, I don't they don't feel like a control a control house. They don't need to be a control house. Um, just a, a few more efficient cards. Could work out for them a way to leverage valor could work out for them but really it does feel like the other houses need to be brought down they're so far ahead right now i'm not sure if you could print two or even three cards for them and say okay they're good now they're gonna beat a really good martel deck they're gonna beat a really good lannister deck i'd rather see the other decks brought kind of to the middle control options is what i'm looking for if i'm oh, okay, going okay. to play the house i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> they, they they can get good like they can get a rush build going I guess but that's boring so I won't play it. <laughs> Someone's got to be able to rush though, right? Someone. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And they, I feel like like they are intended to replace the old Baratheon rush, right? right. Tyrell is the new Barra rush, and um, it just doesn't. So we work have to wait until FFG gives up on that. <laughs> Well, yeah. we have to wait until it win like a real rush deck wins one event, and then they'll just that that's when the restricted list will happen, right? Happen. So chat chat wants to know, assuming a restricted list, what would you like to see on it? That's a whole. I don't episode. want a restricted list. I don't either. I think Lucas is wrong. Is the question what should be on it, or what do I want on it? <laughs> What, what well, do you want? I, th I, th I think they're meant to be linked. I'm I curious. Mean, I meant that the normative and opinionating part of it are supposed to be linked. So, I think you start with some of the the best cards that are out there right now. I mean, I, I don't have a final list in mind, but you look at some of the best cards and some of the best cards that are being comboed together in, in, in two or three or four card combos and just try and break some of those up, whether it's um, like Miri and the Hound, Tywin, Tyrion. I mean, these are just popping into my head. Maybe Gaston. Um, I'm like, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't put enough thought to like make my dream list. Uh, but I think there was a lot of worry about a restricted list for first edition, and I'm of the opinion that it really helped save that game and and gave it a much more interesting competitive field when they did institute it. So I mean, maybe 2.0 is a different beast and it wouldn't have the same effect, but 
uh, I don't know, history showed me that it that it really did help. So I think it's it's a worthy option to explore. Yeah, I think it can help, and especially as as Buzz uh, says, uh, it can help uh, shuffle around the deck building a little bit when the meta gets stale. But I think if they just want to restrict things to balance the meta, I think I would rather at at the moment try for them to try and solve it by releasing new good cards for the for Tarell, for well, not the Night Torch anymore because they are getting good cards, but. <laughs> Uh, Torg, Torg maybe needs something to to have that edge, and Tyrell maybe needs good cards. I don't want uh, I don't want a restricted list yet because I want them to solve it with releasing new cards that balance it yep. out in that way instead. I agree. I definitely agree. I think the restricted list, the way in which two point exists right now, because this card's pull is small, should be used when there's card droughts to prevent podcasts like Beyond the Wall, Second Sons, and The White Book to constantly be bitching about. Because the competitive season <laughs> at the end of the day is about creating hype for your game, right? Purely to FFG's like selfishness. It's about creating hype and excitement about your game. Um, you want to create hype, and competitive players get excited when the meta changes. And the meta changes through two ways. One, new cards. Or two, removing cards from the format. And so... When you're releasing new cards, don't change the format. When you're not releasing cards, shake the format up. So right now, nominally, uh, we are getting new cards. So I'm, I'm not on the restricted list team. But say come around spring of next year, the, the gap between the second and third cycle, or more recently, like the gap between the first and second cycle. Like Gen Con, I think, should have had a restricted list. I think it would have made Gen Con much more of an exciting experience. Uh, I no would offense. want no offense, no offense. <laughs> but it just would have. And how uh, how soon in advance would you have liked it to make it, as you say, an exciting experience? As soon as that, like I think June they could have announced, or end of June they could have announced the restricted list that lasted until the first pack of the second cycle became legal. Oh, so you're talking about a dynamic list where stuff would leave and then almost or and almost immediately come back kind of like what uh, happened with pentoshi in first edition where it's yeah <laughs> i mean unless there's truly problem cards which sure. there are which you may or may, may I not argue that there are right now in second edition um i think pentoshi is an example of kind of a problem card or miri well, I, meant, I meant i meant the other pentoshi pentoshi manor but that's all right yeah so all right um cool so uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. I was asked to give a plug for the Laughing Tree Tournament, which is uh, happening the Tuesday before Worlds. Uh, so if you're flying in early, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, did Julio like... ask you to do that? He's a very nice person. Julio did ask me to do that. He was, <laughs> his was part of the, it was part of his Valor question was, is Valor going to be legal for Worlds and Laughing Tree? <laughs> uh, and, and I told him I would get that in there. Uh, so... He, uh, he does run a good event. You saw all the coverage of King in the, King in the North. Uh, so definitely, uh, if you can get your flight early enough to do that, I think we have. So uh, I should be there, and hopefully some of the other SoCal guys will be there. So definitely check that out. Um, we have one the more question. The Black Street Tournament, real quick, though. That's yeah. a tournament that doesn't make sense. Like, what am I playing the day before Worlds? What, <laughs> what gotta, deck am I playing? You got to warm up, man. <laughs> I played warm up games before before Gen Con Wednesday but, at two AM when I got in. Chris, do you play the the deck that you're gonna play in the in the Worlds tournament? Uh, I think it depends. If I'm playing a stock deck, sure. Like if I if I was going and I was gonna bring the equivalent of the Landing Dragon from Worlds, sure, I'll play that. Get some reps with it. Uh, if it's something I'm gonna try and surprise with, then I probably don't. So it depends on how much the deck relies on that sort of element of surprise. All right, so our last question is uh, from somebody who wishes to remain anonymous, and it's kind of a complicated one, and I don't know if we'll be able to give a satisfactory answer. Um, the The short version of the question is, what would you do, and Andreas, you may be the expert on this, what would you do if you have issues with your local retailer or distributor uh, and then mm. it goes into an explanation that he had a local shop 
who had some issues in the past. Um, they they had a player come in from out of town, and the owner was there, and the owner was was kind of talking bad about other shops and players in his own shop, and uh, apparently just kind of causing a scene, if you will, and and it's a store that they used to frequent, and now they're not so sure they want to go there anymore. Um, so, so what do you do in the situation of a, a bad store situation, or, or I guess in the case of maybe of Europe, a bad distributor situation? Um, you can, I mean, if they don't want to go there, there are two routes to go. Either they, they talk to him and be honest, like, dude, seriously, uh, what's up? And can, can we solve this somehow? Can you stop bitching <laughs> about other stores. <laughs> I mean, talk talk good about your own store, but stuff like that, you sure. know. Or you just boycott, boycott them. We're a fan of that. We're socialists in Sweden. Um, yeah, just, you, I think the optimal way is try, try and uh, make peace, uh, ma make them understand that it, it's an issue that you would like to go there, but you, you won't if that's how things are handled. Um, with bad distributors, kind of the same thing. Um, you try and well, reason yeah. with them as much as you can. And, uh, if they don't want to, you just go to FFG. If, if you have trouble with FFG, come to me and I'll help you. Well, Andreas, could you define that? Maybe go to FFG. Could you clarify that? Who do you email? What are you doing? Are you sending a, a letter in the mail? What are you doing? Okay, so I've been bitching a lot about our distributor before. Now I have contact with them and we're in good relations. Before, I tweeted at their, at their stuff and I got replies. I emailed them mostly every day. Uh, and this is the distributor, uh, not FFG. No, 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 to FFG. Uh, okay, Fantas got it, got it, got it. Is it info at FFG.com or something like that? I don't know. You can find the uh, the emails on uh, on websites, but also uh, they have new contact forms, right? And you can, um, I mean, I have. Uh, three or four of them on Facebook, so I can just nag in those channels, but it, there are ways to contact them, and right. my experience is that they are most active on Twitter. It's almost like Facebook, where if you complain openly, they are more concerned with answering quickly, so <laughs> tw Twitter has been really good for me when contacting FG uh, and wanting quick replies. Have any of the rest of you had a bad experience with a store, and and maybe have you how you've dealt with that? Uh, I I know there's a few stores in SoCal that have had issues before, and for a long time we didn't do anything. Right, there was just no real concerted effort to change the way things were happening, um, and and unfortunately, I think we paid the price for a couple of years because of that. Until recently. FFG kind of made it a little easier to contact them. They have a form now, I think, where you can kind of um, submit a report about an event that took place, whether you're, you want to applaud it or criticize it. But I think it's really there to criticize it and let them know, listen, things might not be, be legit at this place. They're not run the way I, we think you want them to be run. Um, and so I know we kind of made a more concerted effort this year to, to follow those official avenues, and hopefully we'll see a change by next year. But... Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that FFG at least has an avenue now that they pointed us towards. We'll see if it comes to anything, but it felt good typing into those fields, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. It's very cathartic. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's all the uh, that's all the questions we have, I believe. Uh, all right. Does anybody have any? Roy, you want to close this out? Yeah, I'm going to probably close this out now. Does anybody have any final thoughts? Because it's like 1 a.m. EST, so I'm going to throw it yes. to Seth. At 1 a.m., I just have one closing thought, which is, again, if you if you are willing to support the idea of having a player of the year system in the way I described, please go to that card game DB thread and just post a comment with a suggestion or support or anything. 
um, just so we can build some momentum and try and carry that forward to, to make something happen in the end. So thank you guys. Thanks for having me on also. Of course, Seth. You've, you've been both a great guest when we had you on last time and gave you a really hard time about losing to Chris <laughs> and, uh, and this episode. But also, I will make sure that I have the link to that uh, in the YouTube and uh, the SoundCloud text files. So people should be able to find that. Uh, we'll put it also in the uh, uh, Facebook post on our Facebook page, which I will ask you at the end of this. But you should go ahead. If you are on Facebook, that reprehensible way of communicating, uh, you should go ahead and like our page uh, to follow for when we have awesome guests like Seth and all these kind of things. So uh, if you've made it this far, uh, 1 a.m., what time is it uh, on the West Coast? Only Only ten. So, or it's what seven a.m., six a.m. in 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 Sweden, Buzz. What time Uh, is it? It's seven now. Yep. Seven a.m. So, if you've made it to any of these various times, I appreciate you sticking with us. Or if you're just listening on the podcast for making it all the way for like the three-hour episode, I think two-hour episode that we've done here. So. Thank you very much, and we will possibly be back next week. That's kind of up in uh, up in the air, but we, there's a high chance we might do two weeks in a row and then take a week off. So uh, hopefully we will see you soon, and uh, thanks for watching slash listening. And I want to thank Seth again for being a great guest. Before we sign off, being... oh, go ahead. I see there's some questions here about Valar, and I just want to say quickly, we won't be discussing Valar because Chris, the SoCal meta, and us – we have to win at the World Championship. So here, <laughs> in case Valar is released, we will not be discussing any opinions or thoughts on Valar. We'll have to leave everybody in the dark for our small advantage. It's lies. Well, no, or you'll just tell lies. That's the other thing, right? That's right. You'll just lie. So, all right, cut the stream buzz on that. <laughs>